thanks everyone for joining for this fifth and last um, session in our series about safe kids and healthy families. Today we're going to be talking about how to talk to kids about sex and sexuality. So there's going to be a little bit of overlap with some of the stuff that we talked about last time um, and then a few new things as well. And so this is the fifth in a series of five. Um, and if you haven't seen the other four, they are all posted up on YouTube now, so you can access those. And as I had mentioned, uh, maybe the last time or the time before, it doesn't really um, matter to watch them all in sequence, um, but they do in some ways build upon each other. So um, we'll sort of be referencing back to some stuff we've talked about before. So if you've watched them all, then there's a little bit of context there. As always, before I start, just acknowledging that my work takes place and that I am speaking to you today from the traditional unceded territory of the Tecumseh State Equipment people. I'm always very grateful to be able to be a guest here um, in this place that really I do find so uh, such a nourishing place to live. Um, and so really makes me reflect on the way this place has been taken care of since the beginning and how I can add to its stewardship. And I need to update my picture because this picture of Pipsil is now making me feel cold. So a little bit about us before I start. I'm Jen, the Community Partnerships and Public Edu Education Coordinator at KSAC, which is the Kamloops Sexual Assault Counseling Center. Um, we provide counseling and community-based victim services and crisis response services to people who've experienced sexualized or domestic violence in the community. And we also do education and outreach. So stuff like what we're doing here today. And we're also joined today by Heidi, who is one of our counselors and she works with both adults and children and families um, who've experienced abuse or assault and has lots of experience in talking to kids and teens and families about healthy sexuality and healthy sexual behaviors. So we're really lucky to have her here today to support us and also to help facilitate a Q&A at the end of the session. A couple little housekeeping bits. So just asking that people keep their mics off um, until the end of the presentation, just so that we don't have any background noise. And then to keep your camera off as well if you don't want to be in the recording. And then, as I said, we'll have time for a Q&A at the end of the session. So if you have questions that come up while I'm going through the material, feel free to just pop them in the chat. Or if you have a question that's sort of a clarifying question that you wanna have answered right away, you can always interrupt me to ask that. Um, but otherwise we'll get to questions at the end. And then also when thinking about questions, just being mindful of confidentiality. So not sharing any pieces of information that would like not talking about, especially kids by name or just any other identifying factors that would sort of uh, let someone know who you were discussing. So what are we gonna talk about today? We're gonna to start by looking at what healthy sexual development looks like in kids, because I think that having an understanding of this can help reframe behaviors that some people might think are a sign of um, something traumatic having happened to a kid or um, something that's a bit of a red flag. And so we'll talk a little bit about the differences between things that might be red flag behaviors and how to address those and the difference and, and then contrasting that to what is just normal, healthy development in kids. Then we'll talk a little bit about some of the issues and concerns to address when it comes to youth and sexual behaviors and sexuality and kind of how to navigate that difficult part of transitioning into um, teenagehood and then adulthood. We'll talk about some strategies for having uncomfortable conversations. And then we'll talk about some resources, which are both things that can be helpful as a parent or a caregiver or someone who has kids in their life that they wanna to talk to about these things. Um, and also some resources specifically for kids as well that you might be able to point them towards um, because sometimes it's easier to just point them to resources and then let them come back to you with questions than to sit them down for a sort of intense one-on-one -on -one about these things, but we'll chat about all of that. I also just want to talk a little bit about the content of the presentation today and just really normalize that 
some of this stuff might feel uncomfortable. It might be a little bit embarrassing um, to think about these things in kids. It might also be upsetting or triggering depending on your own personal experience. Um, or, you know, if there are people in your life who you're concerned about. And so just to first of all say that any reaction that you have to this is completely normal and totally okay. And also just to think about how you might support yourself after listening to this material. And so that might be just having a self-care plan in place for yourself. So knowing that after you watch this today live, um, or if you're watching it at some point later on the replay, just thinking about how you're going to maybe be a little bit gentler with yourself afterwards if you're feeling a little bit activated, um, or maybe you do need to reach out for some support. And so that might look like calling KSAC's anti-violence crisis line to just have someone to talk to about what you're feeling or what you're processing, or maybe to get connected to resources in the community. But just to point out that there are, there are supports and resources available to you and that it's really okay to have a reaction to this content. And not that anything we're gonna go into is going to be um, intentionally sort of um, confronting or anything like that, but, but just that these topics can be um, pretty loaded for people and that that's totally okay. So as I said, I wanna just start by talking about what healthy sexuality looks like. And I thought that this quote was really good to remind us that sexuality is about more than sex. It's our values, attitudes, feelings, interactions, and behaviors. And that sexuality is emotional, social, cultural, and physical. So sometimes when we think of sexuality, we sort of think of like the act of people having partnered sex. Um, but there's so much more about that. Like it has so much to do with our attitudes and our beliefs and what we think about sex and who we think has sex or doesn't. Um, and so, it's important to keep that in mind that when we think about sexuality in this way, it's just a part of our lives. Like everyone, regardless of whether you are or aren't having sex, who you are or aren't having sex with, um, sexuality is just a component of being a human. And so if we frame it in that way, because I think sometimes in the context that we live in, sexuality becomes this really big deal. Like it's, it's really important or it's really taboo. Um, we sometimes forget to just think about it as an aspect of our humanity. And so understanding that from the perspective of a parent or a caregiver, we understand that child sexual development and, and knowing what that looks like can help caregivers understand the difference between healthy behavior. That's just a normal part of kind of growing up and coming to understand yourself um, and then things that are a cause for concern. And to understand too that kids are exploring all aspect of their realities from the time that they're little infants, like um, understanding what it means to have a body and sexuality does become part of that, especially as they get older and it sort of happens slowly in phases. And so we're gonna talk about what that might look like at different ages and developmental stages. So a couple of main things to keep in mind about what defines healthy versus unhealthy sexuality. Um, are some of these following characteristics. So if youth are being playful and curious, then, you know, usually that's a good sign that this is just a, a healthy sort of developing of their sexual understanding of themselves. If they're acting really aggressively or angrily, then that might be a little bit of a red flag to look at what else is going on in that kid's life. Um, they should be exploring and being curious with peers their same age and developmental level, not with kids who are a bunch younger or a bunch older. So, you know, two like four-year-olds trying to look at each other's bodies or whatever is quite different than like a 12-year-old trying to look at a four-year-old or things like that. So being curious about kids their own age um, is definitely more of a just sort of a um, a thing that kids do if they're really interested in younger kids then that might also be a little bit of a, a thing to look at and then the behavior that they're displaying shouldn't be physically or emotionally harmful to themselves or to the kids that they're interacting with so again like just like we've talked about with lots of things in terms of boundaries and consent they shouldn't be um kind of coercing other like their peers or kids into doing things that 
the kids clearly don't want to do. Um, and they shouldn't be doing things that they themselves don't want to do. And then another um, something that characterizes a healthy sexual development is that if this is something that they're doing, like just a form of play that they're engaging in, but adults set limits to those behaviors or tell them like this is an, an appropriate time to do that, that they stop. It doesn't seem something that's like really compulsive or like they can't seem to stop doing it. Um, so that's also another sign that, um, you know, that may or may not fall under a healthy development um, based on whether or not it seems a little more compulsive than something that they're able to, to limit themselves on with guidance. So we'll kind of look at what that might look like as kids are going through sort of from being an infant into a teen. So with infancy, sort of that zero to two range, we see like there's no inhibitions about nudity, like they have no idea what that means. Um, they're just really exploring what it is to be in a body. And so they're curious about their bodies, including their genitals and may touch them. And just in the same way that little infants are like, oh my gosh, I have feet and toes. They're like, oh, I have a penis or whatever. Like it's, you know, there's certainly no sort of sexual component to that. They're just exploring their reality and their body is the closest thing to them in their physical reality. And so they're really spending time exploring that and, and just discovering what that is. So then getting a little bit older between two to five, they might sort of be masturbating sometimes or touching their genitals in a way that looks like masturbation, which is more generally as a soothing technique and for pleasure. Again, just kind of discovering sensations in their bodies. Um, they might be doing sort of playful exploring and that sort of curious exploration with kids their age, um, which might look like, again, like, you know, talking about what, parts they have or like trying to look at each other's bodies or things like that um, and again like not in a way that's overtly sexual because still at this age like they're just developing an understanding of that um, maybe even in the later part of that two to five range but still don't really understand what that is um, and then they might be starting to ask questions about sex and bodies um, and just generally sort of getting curious about you know the parts of of bodies that they're starting to have an understanding have like a different implication than like arms and legs, but they don't really know what that means yet. And so we can encourage healthy development in this stage by using anatomically correct terms for body parts. And I know that this is something that I think people have been talking more about in the last few years, um, that like using the correct anatomical terms for body parts, including genitals, is a way both to, I think, like remove some of the shame and stigma that people have been taught about those parts of their bodies. Because I mean, we call an arm an arm because there's no reason not to refer to it that way. You know, there's nothing we're trying to hide about the fact that it's an arm or like the functions of an arm are not shameful to us. Um, and so there's no reason that we shouldn't do the same with a penis or with a vulva. And so that kids understand that these are just parts of their bodies. They serve different functions. Some of them are sexual, but they also do other things. And the thing about using correct anatomical terms as well is that it makes it less ambiguous if a child tells an adult, like this person touched my, you know, if they're using some sort of pet name for their genitals, then, then that adult might have no idea what they're talking about. Like, what is is that your stuffed toy? Like, um, whereas if they say this person touched my penis, then that sort of unequivocally, that adult is gonna know what they're talking about. Um, another way to encourage healthy development is by providing simple age appropriate answers um, to questions about bodies and functions. So, you know, kids who are, say three or four years old, if they ask where babies come from, they don't probably need like a whole anatomy and physiology lesson at that point, but just to know that, you know, a sperm and an egg come together and then a baby grows inside a womb. And so that might be enough information for them. You can kind of start by just giving them a little bit of information that's factual, but not overwhelming. And then just kind of keep building on that as they get older. And then teaching about appropriate settings for behavior without shaming them. So again, like if kids are starting to sort of touch their genitals in a more um, kind of 
way that might look like masturbation, then telling them like, you know, that's not a bad thing, but also it's not appropriate in some settings. Like we don't do that at school or we don't do that when, you know, people are over for dinner. Um, so just letting them know that like, there are times and places where some behaviors are or aren't appropriate. And then again, as we've talked about a bunch, teaching them about boundaries, both for themselves and others. So helping them to understand, even if the play isn't kind of sexual in nature, but just with anything to do with anyone else, and especially with anyone else's bodies, that we always make sure that the person that we're interacting with wants to do what we're doing. So whether that's like playing tag or whatever it is, giving hugs, you know, interacting with people that we're allowed to set our own limits and that the people we're interacting with are as well. And teaching the difference between good touch and touch that's unwelcome or uncomfortable, which really goes into that boundary setting as well. So teaching kids that like, if they don't like the way a certain family member hugs or kisses them because it's like too squishy or they don't like their perfume or like their kisses or slobbery or whatever, like that they're allowed to say, no, thank you. I'll just like wave or like, you know, I'll give you a high five or giving them options so that we're not forcing them to interact with other people in ways that they don't want to. So then they don't normalize that it's okay for them to do that as well. So then when we start looking at kids getting a bit older, that middle childhood from about five to eight. So at this point, they might be using more slang words for bodies and functions and starting to use more sort of like toilet humor um, and just kind of getting more interested in those kinds of functions. At this age as well, they're starting to understand um, a little bit more about gender roles and what that looks like. like and again, like that sort of changes depending on the context, but you know, things like liking dresses for girls or things like that. Um, and so kids at this time are often starting to sort of explore and understand their own identity around those things as well, which might take a long time depending on um, how they identify and how they understand their identities. And so they might also be engaging a little bit more play that involves exploring or talking about sex with peers or like, you know, play that involves like getting married and things like that. Um, and kind of exploring the ideas of relationships again, whether or not they understand like all of the implications of that is still probably developing. And then if they are kids who tend to masturbate or touch their genitals, which a lot of kids do, they might start doing that in private more because it might sort of move from being something that's a little more, more a little bit more about pleasure and less about self-soothing. And so starting to understand that that's a thing that they do when they're alone. And then getting a little bit more into that sort of preteen age. So they might start experiencing puberty and some of those aspects of change, or maybe they already have, and it might start to speed up even more. They might start being interested in relationships and thinking about dating and attraction and things like that. Again, they might look for more opportunities to see people naked more in a way that is um, sexual than maybe they were when they were littler. And so, you know, this might be a time when they start being interested in like looking at naked people online. And we're going to talk about um, naked people online a little bit later. Um, and then they might also have an increased desire for privacy and independence. And so again, that might be related to starting to sort of understand attraction and feeling more like um, they want to kind of be exploring masturbation more and things like that. And so, or it might just be, you know, as they're kind of coming into their teen years, just figuring out who they are independent from family and parents and just wanting more time to themselves. So the ways that we can encourage healthy development in this stage are by again, explaining the basics of human reproduction. So like we said in the last slide, kind of keeping it age appropriate, you can, if you have been having these conversations with them when they're younger, starting to kind of build on the information that you've given them and give them a little bit more context kind of as they're ready. And it'll really depend on the kid. Like this is gonna be less about what age they are and more about sort of their understanding of things, what they've been exposed to, um, what they're ready to hear, what they want to know, things like that. We can educate about variety and gender expression and sexual orientation in this. I mean, you can, we can be doing this um, really from a very young age. 
but especially when kids are in this stage where they're starting to understand attraction and who they might be attracted to and what their identity might be, then really normalizing that, um, you know, like not every relationship is a hetero relationship and not every person identifies with the sex they were assigned at birth. Um, and we're going to watch a little video about all of that a little bit later too, to just sort of understand some of those variations if that's not something that you're really familiar with. So starting to talk to kids about changes that'll occur, occur in puberty at this stage and really reassuring them about what's normal and what's coming and what to expect. Um, because I think that still sometimes, you know, kids often talk about puberty with their peers and things like that, but are sometimes really still surprised about what's coming. Um, we want to promote an understanding of rights and responsibilities in relationship and teach about boundaries and consent. And so, again, that kind of goes back to that whole idea of teaching kids how to understand what their own boundaries and needs are and how to respect those in other people, whether it's about sex or anything else, um, even relationships and, you know, not coercing people into relationship and things like that. And then giving age appropriate sexuality information. So, you know, teaching kids where they can find resources for safer sex or pregnancy prevention or things like that. Again, maybe they're nowhere near actually wanting to have partnered sex, but to let them know that those things are available for when they're ready. Um, and it's again, like the theory of harm reduction. So if we think that maybe kids are going to start having sex, even in the next couple of years, just like, and even if we wish that that weren't what was happening, um, if it is, then at least equipping them with ways to avoid getting pregnant, avoid catching STIs and things like that um, is going to be better than pretending that it's not going to happen. All right, so we're gonna take a little moment because that was a lot. So feel free to just check in with yourself, um, just recognize how you're feeling at this point in after talking about all that. And then we're gonna hop right back into it, right into our next big topic of porn and hypersexuality. And so we talked about this a bit last time as well, but I wanted to address it again, just because I think that this is a really big thing for kids at this time in history, that it's pretty hard to avoid the fact that kids are going to be exposed um, certainly to hypersexuality, which is this idea where young people are depicted or treated as sexual objects through media or marketing products that encourage them to act in adult sexual ways, which is this definition here from the White Hatter, um, a resource that I talked about last time that helps um, kids and parents navigate digital literacy. And then also that kids are often exposed to porn at some point in their young adulthood to teenage years, um, because it is easily accessible. It's pretty much, there's tons of free porn online and it's anonymous. Um, you know, you don't have to sort of go sneaking around to find magazines under somebody's sink or whatever. Um, it's just sort of there. And so some youth are viewing porn on purpose because they're curious or, you know, they want information about sex. And some kids are seeing it by accident or being shown it by peers. Um, before they have any interest or want to be exposed to those kinds of things. And so the thing about looking at porn for information about sex is that it really doesn't teach you very much about sex. Um, obviously, you know, even the bodies that we see in porn and, and the acts that people do, like it's, it's a staging and it's a big production. Um, and it's not really a reflection on what healthy intimacy or connection looks like. And this is the thing that's really kind of ironic about where we are right now is that sex is really everywhere. But in like, even, even if it's not porn per se, it's like, you know, just so many movies are really hypersexualized in the media and all of these things. But still a lot of us are very uncomfortable talking about sex in a mature and just sort of thoughtful way. And so that makes it really hard, especially as parents or caregivers, if we were raised in a way where like we were never really comfortable talking about these things, and now our kids have all this access to really sexualized material at a young age, um, it can be really hard to know how to handle that. 
Um, and so we're gonna talk a little bit about that. And then also there are some resources at the end that you can look at for having those conversations. Um, TikTok is another place where this comes up. So, and basically again, like this is more so thinking about how to, well, I should say last time we talked about um, online safety and digital literacy for young people and, and social media. And so again, for certain apps like TikTok, it's probably best if they're not on there before they're about 15, because there can be these really adult themes to TikTok or like, you know, ways that kids and teens are being sexually objectified, which I would argue is like more an issue for the adults who are doing that, but also we kind of have no control over that happening to kids. And so it's really about understanding how kids are using apps and social media um, and being able to have conversations with them about that. But also in some cases, just sort of keeping them off social media and apps that are intended potentially for a bit of an older audience until they're a little bit older. So the thing about this is um, there can be, you know, as much as we know that kids are, are going to probably be exposed to things online um, that they might not be ready for or that they don't know how to sort of make sense of, it still might happen. Um, and so thinking about how to mitigate some of those negative consequences is going to be important. So some, but some of those consequences might be like, again, a false understanding of what healthy sexuality looks like. Um, because as I was saying, like porn is a terrible replacement for sex education because it really doesn't have all that much to do with the ways that people actually interact. Um, it's helping kids understand that it's really, it's entertainment more than, more than it is actually about sex or intimacy. Porn also often objectifies women um, and sometimes men as well for sexual gratification. It can influence young people's expectations of sexual experiences. So making them think that they should be doing sexual acts um, or expecting sexual acts that maybe they don't actually want to do. It's also associated with unsafe sex practices like not using protection um, if kids are exposed to a lot of porn without kind of the mitigating um, effect of critical thinking skills. It can lead to stronger gender stereotypes, and especially in young men, which can definitely be harmful, especially when thinking about um, sort of coercion and, and sexual assault and things like that. It's also on top of being often very misogynist and exploitive of women, also often filled with really harmful racial stereotypes and objectification, sort of fetishizing, fetishizing people of different races and also trans people and things like that. And even like people with big bodies, like basically anybody other than sort of um, the standard idea of like a good body becomes like fetishized in porn, which is really not helpful for anyone's self-esteem. And so it can influence people's self-esteem and body image because obviously those performers are doing that line of work um, and so are either modifying their bodies or just have like unnaturally um, specific kinds of bodies that most people are not going to live up to. And so it gives kids like a really skewed sense of what a body should look like. So how can we counteract some of these effects? So if you've been joining us for this series so far, this will be a familiar refrain that you've heard from me many times before, but one of the biggest ways is to build and maintain open conversation with the kids in your life. So having relationship where kids can come to you to talk to you about these kinds of things, that starts long before it ever happens. And sometimes that's not possible because sometimes, you know, kids come into our lives at different stages and ages in their development. And so you haven't had the opportunity um, to be having those conversations, but it's never too late to start having that dialogue and letting them know that you're a safe place to come to. And we'll talk about that a little bit more too when we talk about having difficult conversations. And so also teaching kids about what the difference the difference between what porn is, which is like entertainment made for adults and what it isn't, which is it isn't education about sex or intimacy or connection. There's a really great um, sex ed 
our sexual health educator in Kamloops, um, Mosaic sexual health, I believe it's called. Uh, Martha Solomon is the woman who runs it. And she just did a talk for the school district about talking to kids about porn. Um, and so if you're watching this live or um, near to when it was recorded on March 29th, um, the some of the information about that talk is on Martha's social media on Mosaic Sexual Health. And she has really great prompts about how to have conversations with kids about porn and explain to them what it is and what to do if they've interacted with it and didn't want to and how to talk about it. Um, so I would definitely recommend checking that out. And I've linked her info in the resources. And then just teaching critical thinking skills generally um, so that kids understand what they're seeing um, when they're seeing things. And this might not be porn necessarily, but like hypersexualized media and things like that, teaching kids how to think through like, do people actually have bodies like this? What about Photoshopping, all of that? And we talked more about that in the last session as well. So you can check that out. And then not reinforcing gender role stereotypes, especially when it comes to sex, like not reinforcing some of these ideas in kids that like boys always wanna have sex and girls play hard to get, or like boys can't control themselves or things like that, which really are very harmful um, and can lead to some of the issues that we see around assaults or you know just people not understanding how to set their own boundaries or how to respect someone else's boundaries and so again a familiar refrain as well teaching about respect and boundaries and consent from as early a time as possible long before kids are ever thinking about interacting with other people sexually and then connecting with resources for yourself and your kids so this might be a really difficult conversation to have so maybe there are places where you can get some help or again, like resources that you can share with kids so that they can read about maybe like debunking things around body image um, and porn. And then they can open up a conversation, come and ask you questions later or things like that. So another issue of concern in terms of, um, sort of modern teen life and sexuality is something we talked about last time too. And we're gonna just go into a little bit more depth today. And that's this idea of intimate images, nudes and sexting. And so a couple of definitions. Um, and this graphic comes from the White Hatter, which is that um, website that I mentioned earlier. And this is sort of something they created for people to keep on their phone and send to someone who might be asking them repeatedly um, to send a nude or you know, asking them in an inappropriate setting um, to send nudes. So sexting is any kind of sexual text messages, um, which may or may not contain nude images. So sexting could also just be like sexually explicit language in a text. Um, but it often, often when we think of sexting, we also think of sending nudes. Sextortion is the threat of distributing nudes for the purpose of extortion or blackmail. We talked a bit about this last time too, about um, how sometimes people will get someone to send a nude, whether they've coerced them into it or they've done it willingly, and then tell them that they're going to leak that to the person's family or friends or boss or whatever it is, um, if they don't send more nudes or send money or things like that. And so um, for more info about that, you can look at the last um, webinar. And then the distribution of nudes or the non-consensual distribution of intimate images, as it's, I think that's like officially what the law is called, is knowingly publishing, selling, distributing, transmitting intimate images when the person being depicted did not give their consent. And so this isn't like sharing a nude of yourself willingly with someone um, who wants it, because that's another key point. And we're going to talk about that in the next slide. Um, this is taking a nude that you've been given and sharing it with other people without the person in the images consent to do that. So in Canada in 2018, and this was a study from the White Hatter, 41% of teens, it does, I don't know the age range, but I'm guessing if it's teens, it's um, 13 to 19, had sent a sex and 42% stated that the sex that they sent did not remain private. However, I think that it's also important to remember that 58% of them did. 
So over half of those 41% of teens who sent a sex, like nothing, nothing happened. Um, they sent it to their partner potentially or someone they were interested in or for whatever reason. Um, and that was that. And so I think that it's important that we understand that like so many other things, when we talk about youth and section and sexuality, it's like, we, we sometimes have an immediate response of like, oh, that they shouldn't be doing that. But I think that we can reframe sexting as a way that kids can, or youth, I should say, can kind of be exploring their sexual identity in a way that might feel safer to them than actually engaging in physical sex or sex acts with a person that they are intimate with, but don't want to go to that physical place of intimacy with at this point. And so I think that more than just saying like, oh, you should never sex. And we're going to talk about this too, this kind of idea of abstinence. Um, it's, it can be reframed as just like, this is kind of part of our lives now. Like sexting is kind of part of, for many people, having a sexual relationship. And that isn't necessarily different for youth. And just like having a sexual relationship for youth, it can be done in a way that's healthy, consensual, um, and and fun and positive. Um, it doesn't always have to be that it's a negative thing. But there are instances where issues come up, and so we're going to talk about that too. So the thing with sexting and the law, um, it's important to know because I think that some people think that, or there's sort of unclarity around whether or not a young person, so someone under 18, sending a naked picture is considered child pornography. And in Canada, it really isn't. Um, there has been case law where a judge has said that if young people wanna send intimate images of themselves or themselves with their partners to each other and just share them with each other and keep them private, that they are allowed to do that as a way of exploring their sexuality. But um, what's depicted in the photos has to be legal. And so what that means is like um, those age of consent laws that we talked about back a few sessions ago apply. So no one under 12 can send any kind of intimate images because um, under 12 can't consent to any kind of sexual activity. 12 and 13 can share with someone less than two years older, 14 and 15 less than five years older, and then 16 year olds can consent to sex as long as it's not with someone who has a, any kind of power dynamic over them. So all of that applies just in terms of whether or not an image is considered child pornography. Um, so the issue that comes with sharing nudes is that sharing someone's nude when they didn't consent to you sharing it to someone else, that's illegal. And also sharing a nude to someone without their consent is illegal. So this idea of like dick pics that we've probably all heard about, guys just sending pictures of their genitals to women who never asked for it and don't want it, that is not okay. Um, it is a form of sexual violence and sexual assault, though I don't know that a person would actually get charged with it. And like just sort of morally and ethically, it's not okay. So people can be charged for sharing nudes um, without the person's consent, but they're much more likely to be charged with non-consensual distribution than they are with child pornography. And this isn't an important point because I think that sometimes these abstinence education programs are still trying to tell kids that like, if you send a nude, you're gonna be charged with child pornography and like, you're gonna go to jail and you're gonna be a sexual offender, um, which really isn't true. And the thing about that kind of framing is that it just makes it so kids won't talk to someone about what happened if an issue arises. So you can just imagine how if you tell a kid, like if you send a nude, you're a child pornographer. Um, if they send that nude and it gets leaked, they're not gonna come to you for help. Um, and so I think it's really important that we, even if this is behavior that we don't want kids to be acting out, or if we want them to be doing it safely, there are ways to talk about that that are giving them accurate information um, rather than just scaring them into thinking something really bad will happen. Because like with 
with any kind of abstinence only education, it doesn't work. And it often just sends that behavior underground and then we're not able to help kids. So what are some alternatives to abstinence or to victim blaming? So just telling kids like, oh, well, you sent that sex. So what did you think was gonna happen? So one thing is harm reduction. So for kids who, or for youth who do want to be sending intimate images to their partner or someone that they're involved with who wants to receive them, um, some of those ideas can be like, don't show your face or cover any kind of identifying features like birthmarks or tattoos. Don't have anything in your background that really identifies you. And so in this way, then if something does happen, if that image does get leaked, it'll be a little bit easier to be distanced from it. Whether that's like, you know, just saying, oh, that isn't me or like even just knowing that your face isn't there. And so there is, um, it's a little bit less personal, like everyone's seeing your, your face in this nude image. Um, and then another thing to think about for harm reduction for the person receiving the nude, and we talked about this last time too, was that like, if your partner sends you a naked picture, um, you can sort of use it for its intended purpose and then delete it off of your phone or off of your computer. Because, you know, sometimes kids make poor decisions um, when they're in an emotional state. So like, maybe right now you think like, oh yeah, I love this person. I would never do anything to harm them. Maybe they break up with you and you're really mad. And you're like, oh, I'm gonna get back at them um, and make a bad decision and send that picture to somebody. Um, or, you know, you're drunk and your friends pressure you into proving to them that you're getting nudes or whatever it is. So by just not having it around, you sort of remove that temptation. So that can be another aspect of harm reduction to think about. And then one of the things about people having their nudes leaked um, that was showed up in the research around this that I was reading is that a lot of those youth reported that an unsupportive response from parents or friends or caregivers was one of the most harmful aspects of having that nude circulated. So when youth went to someone for help or were distressed about what had happened and the response was, well, what did you think when you sent that? Like, what were you thinking? That that was worse in fact than having that picture leaked. And so it's really important that we don't downplay the reaction to having this happen or the impact of it because it can be really devastating. And regardless of what you think, about the nude being sent in the first place, it's still not the fault of the person who sent it that it was then sent on to other people. And so we can respond to this like we would with any other incident of sexualized violence. And we talked about um, responding to sexualized violence in the session on healthy relationships. And so that sort of idea of like listening, believing and supporting the person and letting them know that that person didn't have a right to do that to them. And, you know, maybe that becomes later on a conversation about like, if you do want to send nudes, like here are some ways that maybe next time you can be safer. Um, but even that can come a little bit later. Like in the meantime, the best thing is to help support the person. And also there are places you can connect to that can help you get a picture taken offline if it's been posted online um, or even just some strategies for for getting um, kids, like if it's just their peer group or in their school to delete the picture and then sort of how to support them. And so there are resources like the White Hatter, Media Smarts and CyberTip. And I think most of those are in the resources today. And if not, they're in the resources from last session that can help um, with this situation because it might feel really overwhelming and you might not know what to do about it, but there are organizations and people who can help. So connecting to that can be really important. All right, so then as we move into talking to kids about these issues um, and having difficult conversations, I wanted to watch this short video about um, understanding sexual orientation and gender identity and gender expression. Because as I was saying before, it's important that when we're framing these conversations, we're making them inclusive so that we are capturing kids who might be really exploring what their identity or their attraction is and not leaving them out or erasing their experiences. 
Um, it was surprisingly hard to find a video that captured all of that in, in one um, sort of chunk, um, but this one did a pretty good job. It's obviously from a bigger presentation. So he's gonna say like, before we move into this um, other conversation. So just a heads up. And then also like the, it's an animation, but the sound is sort of like off. Anyways, so it's not the perfect video, but I think it did a pretty good job of the content. So I'm going to pull that up and we will give it a watch. Hello, and thanks for joining us today. Before we get started with today's live content, we want to talk about some basic terminology that is important to know when working with people who have diverse sexual orientations or diverse gender identities. There are four elements of identity that you will need to know. Sex assigned at birth, gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation. First is sex assigned at birth, which is based on physical anatomy. This is often a sign before or immediately after birth by looking at the baby's anatomy. The most typical sex assigned at birth is either female or male, but there are other variations of sex worth noting. Variation in sex characteristics can be variations among hormones, chromosomes, or anatomy. The term intersex is used as an umbrella term for those born with varying sex characteristics. About one in every 100 people are born intersex. That's more common than most people think. So contrary to popular belief, there are in fact more sexes than just male or female. The next important term to know is gender identity. Gender identity is a person's internal sense of their own gender. All people have a gender identity, though not many people think about it. Gender identity is how you feel about your gender and your role in your culture's gendered practices. Gendered practices vary from culture to culture, so there isn't only one way to define being a girl, woman, boy, man, or any other gender. Gender identity forms very early in childhood, with some signs pointing to as early as two years old. When young children start to say, I'm a boy, or I'm a girl, they are describing how they feel about their own gender. I would like to explain a few key terms related to gender identity. The word cisgender describes a person whose gender identity and sex assigned at birth match. The word transgender describes a person whose gender identity differs from their sex assigned at birth. The term transgender is also an umbrella term for gender identities like gender fluid, non-binary, and agender. For more information on these terms, click the glossary link in the description. The next term you will want to know is gender expression. Gender expression describes how people express their gender externally. This could be through clothing, hobbies, mannerisms, or hairstyles. Gender expression and the expectations around expression have changed over time and they may change day to day depending on how a person feels. Sometimes, one might dress more masculine one day and then decide to dress more feminine the next day. It's important to note that gender expression does not tell us how someone identifies their gender, and it is best not to assume who someone is based on their style of clothing. It's best to ask the person how they identify. Lastly, we will talk about sexual orientation. Sexual orientation describes feelings of attraction. Think back to when you had your last crush. What were the feelings you had? Maybe you felt excited when you saw the person you liked. Maybe you got nervous or shy around them. Or maybe your heart raced and you had attraction. Think back to when you had your last crush. What were the feelings you had? Maybe butterflies. These are all feelings of attraction. Attraction can mean different things to different people, but one thing to note is that these feelings are not a choice or something someone can control. We cannot tell our heart to slow down or our butterflies to go away. Sexual orientation can start to form around early childhood. 
Think back to when you had your very first crush. This is when your sexual orientation started to develop. Common terms you hear associated with sexual orientation are lesbian, gay, bisexual, pansexual, queer, and straight. Lesbian describes a girl or woman who is primarily attracted to other girls or women. Gay describes boys or men who are primarily attracted to other boys or men. But this term is also used by anyone who is attracted to the same gender. Bisexual refers to people who are attracted to their own gender as well as other genders. Pansexual refers to someone who is attracted to people regardless of gender. Asexual is used to describe someone who may not feel sexual attraction to any gender. This does not mean that the person doesn't want to be in relationships. It just means that the element of sexual attraction is absent. You might have also heard the term queer. Queer is used as an umbrella term that can only be defined by the individual using it. The term continues to be hurtful to some people especially older populations who experience this term as a slur. However, some people use this term as a source of pride and a symbol of determination. It's always best to use the term only if the person self-identifies as queer and if the person gives you permission to refer to them in that way. Lastly, some people identify as straight, which means they are attracted to people of the opposite gender. Now that you have some basic terminology under your belt, you're ready to jump into the more specific content to get to know this population's experiences better and to gain skills on how to serve them best. I think that that did a pretty good job of just kind of summing up um, some of those ideas. And so, if any of that was new, um, you know, there's lots of other places you can access to learn more about um, some of those terms or things that um, might not be familiar. But yeah, just as, as a starting point for understanding that we are often used to thinking about things in sort of uh, hetero and cisgender ex person's experience. Um, but we know that that's there's so much variation in how kids and and people experience attraction um, and identity and all kinds of things like that. And so when we're thinking about having these conversations, just being mindful of all of those different ways that a person might experience um, their reality. So then how do we talk to kids about healthy sexuality? This is obviously, you know, sometimes kind of the hard part, especially if we're still unpacking a lot of our own stuff around these ideas. So we talked about this last time too, but you want to talk often about these things, not just sort of sitting kids down for like the talk and just leaving it at that, but making this an ongoing dialogue from as early as, as you can really, understanding that it's never too early to start these conversations and also that it's never too late. You wanna be honest about how you're feeling. So it's totally okay to name that it's awkward or embarrassing or sort of uncomfortable, uncomfortable for you to have these conversations. And that like working through those things together is okay. Like you don't have to know it all. You don't have to be an expert um, and you don't have to be like totally cool about having these conversations because it is difficult and, and naming that can be humanizing. Listen to your kids' opinions, even if you don't agree with them. Um, understand that that's their reality and it's better to know what they're thinking and doing or what their peers are doing um, than to just be like, oh, I don't wanna hear about that. Sometimes talking in the car or out for a walk can be easier than sort of a sitting down, like facing each other kind of thing, which can feel really confronting. If you're both sort of sitting or walking together and like looking straight ahead, it can sometimes be easier to talk about difficult things. Be ready for lots of questions and also be honest if you don't know the answer. So it's totally okay to be like, you know what? I've actually never heard of that thing you just said. Um, so I can't really tell you what it is, but I will do some research and get back to you. Or again, saying like, well, 
let's like check out this website. They probably have some information about that. So providing books and online resources, giving kids options for how they might want to engage with this content. And again, we've got some resources at the end to share. And also knowing that this is going to be as awkward as it might be, or you know, you might feel like you're sort of pulling teeth trying to have these conversations, understand that there is a payoff because it's been shown that kids who talk to their parents about sex and, sex and healthy relationships are more likely to make healthy choices. So whether that's delaying when they have sex or using safer sex practices when they start having sex, like there is a payoff to getting to the point where you can have these awkward or uncomfortable conversations. And I think too, like as the adults who are having these conversations with kids, it also helps us to reframe a lot of what we've learned about sex, which might not have been particularly healthy. And going right back to the beginning, to understanding that like sexuality is just part of our experience of humanity. And so having like a lot of shame or discomfort or unease around that, I think that it, it, it doesn't serve us at all. Like being able to understand that as an aspect of who we are, I think is really healthy. And so being asked to confront these things with kids can often be sort of healing for ourselves as well as we unlearn some of the shame or stigma that we might have internalized around sex ourselves. So then what happens when hard stuff comes up? So maybe it's that a kid in your life shared a nude and it got leaked or someone in their life experienced a sexual assault or um you know they just saw something online that they you know are really confused or upset about so the first thing we want to do is stay calm we talked about this last time as well um ask questions to kind of clarify what's happening and then intervene so staying calm might be, you know, easy to say and harder to do, but really just taking a moment to collect yourself, keeping your tone even, kind of being a safe place for your, the kid to come to and avoiding this urge maybe to kind of freak out. Depending on what the situation is, that might be easier or harder. And also like avoiding really harsh punishments um, or restricting technology, especially if it's a situation where the kid who's coming to you isn't really at fault or if it's unclear sort of what the situation is but you know sometimes these harsh punishments or just taking their phones away or things like that it's not really teaching them anything about what happened um and it's you know can cause all kinds of other stuff just because this is so much of kids lives and sort of how they stay connected and engaged with people um so asking questions, and I know that when we had talked about responding to someone who's experienced um, abuse or assault or anything like that, that we said to limit questions because it can sound a bit like interrogating, but in a situation like this where something has come up and you sort of need to get the facts so that you know how to respond properly or what kind of resources to reach out to, this is a, an instance where it makes sense to ask some questions. So it's sort of trying to figure out what the situation is, who's involved, what kind of help is needed um, and how you can pull in some other resources. And then intervening is gonna vary depending on the situation, um, but it might be just teaching kids about how to be safer online. So um, we talked last time about the White Hatter has kind of some agreements that you can set up as a family for like rights and responsibilities online. So maybe reviewing or implementing something like that to keep kids safer online, um, connecting with supports like the White Hatter or connecting them to safer sex options if it's a situation where, you know, maybe there's um, an STI scare or something like that. And then the next thing is to do some work to educate maybe yourself and the youth in your life who's facing a hard situation, um, pay attention to what's going on and then get resourced. So especially if it's a situation where a kid is embarrassed or sort of um, like upset about something but not completely distressed or like really in crisis, um, this can be an opportunity to teach them, teach them about their body or about boundaries or, you know, 
healthy sexual behavior or rules around sexual behavior or things like that. Again, like this might be connecting them to a resource to understand like this thing you experienced is normal, even though it's embarrassing, whatever, like, you know, for sometimes for boys, like getting an erection at school, like it's really embarrassing and really kind of unsettling, but also to let them know like it's normal, it happens, um, there's nothing wrong with you, that sort of thing. So paying attention and finding age appropriate teaching moments. So that might be like with a little kid, if they are, you know, like if they just like getting naked all the time um, or like touch their body or their genitals a lot, like telling them, you know, there are times when that's appropriate and times when it isn't and sort of setting those boundaries. And then getting resourced. So again, if you're experiencing a concerning situation or you have questions, there's some red flags maybe coming up around a kid's behavior, then like access help in the community. So that might be like reaching out to KSAC or just reading some of the books on the book list to understand what's going on. And also getting support for yourself if you're feeling triggered. So again, like everyone comes with their own history and depending on what you've experienced or what you've seen, like maybe your child's behavior is really upsetting or unsettling to you. And so understanding that getting resources for yourself can also be really important. And then if your child shares with you something serious, really affirm them in how brave they are for telling you and let them know that they're not gonna be in trouble and that you love them and that you're gonna keep them safe and then reaching out to KSAC for resources. So this might be like, if, if a kid tells you that someone did something inappropriate, um, someone touched them in a sexual way or anything like that, like really reassuring them too that it's not their fault, um, that they didn't do anything wrong and just being support to them and then getting help for yourself because of course that is something that is going to be really upsetting probably and disturbing for you and the child. Um, so, you know, trying to be a calming grounding force for them, but then also making sure that you're getting yourself resourced because that's obviously a really difficult thing to hear. So then we're just gonna move into resources and then we'll wrap up. So we've got sort of a whole list of books for kids. So these are for kids from quite young into teenage years, puberty and all of that kind of stuff. I'll link all of these books in the notes below the YouTube video. And so you'll be able to just um, link them there to find them um, or on the slides as well, which I'll provide. Um, to SCFS. And then some books for adults and caregivers. So helping you to be resourced to have those conversations or to understand what's going on with kids at different ages. And then some websites and apps for youth. Um, so Sex Etc. is a sex education website for teens. It's sort of written like by and for teens on different subjects around sex and, and sexuality. Real Talk is an app that actually uses like text message based storytelling to go through scenarios that kids may be facing and sort of understand some implications around like dating and sex and things like that. And then Scarlet Teen, which calls itself Sex Ed for the Real World, is another really good website that's aimed at kids and teens for understanding sex and dating and all that kind of stuff. And then some websites for adults for checking out for resources for yourself. Um, so of course, KSAC, if you again are worried um, that a kid might have experienced some sexual abuse or unwelcome sexual behaviors or things like that. Or if you just wanna talk about something that you're a little bit concerned about and um, you know it doesn't have to be um, getting your kid into counseling with us necessarily, but just if you wanted to chat to someone to to check in on something. Mosaic Sexual Health Education is the um, business that I was mentioning before, Martha Solomon's really fantastic sex ed website and her social media is great as well. Everybody Curious is a great website I found from another sex educator. I think she's in Ontario um, and she's just got videos on all kinds of things about how to talk to kids about sex. So there's some really good stuff on there. This next one, Child Sexual Behaviors, A Parent's Guide, it's just um, a list of sort of healthy behaviors at different developmental stages for kids. And so again, I think that that can be helpful sometimes to refer back to if 
a child in your life has gotten to a certain age and is displaying a certain type of behavior to be able to go to that list and say like, oh, okay, that's normal. So that's, you know, that's just um, them figuring out themselves and, and how can I set sort of boundaries on that to make that safe and, and, and appropriate. Um, or like that maybe is a bit of a red flag. So maybe I should talk to somebody. And then Planned Parenthood's YouTube channel also has a whole section for parents and caregivers for talking to kids about sex and different aspects of um, teen dating life and things like that. So that is the end of the content for today. So just invite everyone to take a moment to feel your feelings if anything's come up for you. Um, and again, just to remind you to take some time if you're feeling overwhelmed by some of the content, come back to this later maybe, or reach out um, to a support network, things like that. And then we're gonna wrap up and go into questions. So again, if you're watching this on the replay and you haven't seen the first four sessions, they'll be linked here as well. So you can check those out. Um, and you can always reach out to KSAC or to myself, uh, my email address is there if you have any questions. Um.